um, <clears throat> I work on the SIDM epigraphic database, which is at the moment uh, basically a repository of Sanskrit inscriptions from India. But uh, the plan is that uh, it will, in the future, include non-Sanskrit inscriptions and some also from outside India. So broadly, from uh, the geographical region covered by our project, which is South, Southeast, and Central Asia. Uh, possibly, in the distant future, who knows, it might expand to other areas. Um, essentially, uh, most of the work I do is just uh, digitizing pre-published inscriptions. So there's very little uh, brand new research involved. And for that reason, uh, perhaps uh, my sort of data management uh, might seem to be very simple. Uh, what do I do? I take a printed edition of an inscription. I encode it in an appropriate way. Uh, it becomes a digital edition which is then disseminated on the one hand through a dedicated website, sidam.uk, uh, which is conceived as a dynamic uh, thing, uh, which is also a tool, a research tool, and it's also disseminated on Zenodo, uh, which I mainly see as, as an archive, as a static archive uh, for my work. Um, so the backbone is the text, uh, a text when converted into a digital edition looks like this. It uses the Epidoc format, which has been mentioned yesterday and which I'm not going into. It's a subset of TEI XML, uh, specifically uh, geared for working with inscriptions. Uh, now, of course, things are not as simple as they look at first. Uh, so in case we wish it were that simple, no, it is not. Uh, an inscription is, of course, not just a text, uh, even though I'm um, uh, basically a philologist. Uh, I must admit that an inscription is a lot more than a text, uh, and therefore uh, it comes with a lot of uh, baggage, uh, a lot of metadata that we need to uh, treat, that we need to work with. So uh, the way this talk is going to be set up uh, is first I'm going to try and be very brief, uh, but I have to explain what sort of data I work with and how they fit together. Uh, I've done previous talks on that, and there are some people here who've heard a previous talk of mine in Vienna about that, uh, and i really try to summarize that bit very quickly and concentrate this time on how those data are managed right now, so within the project and within my own workflow, uh, what things look like. Uh, but I have to go into, uh, into a little bit of uh, an explanation of the data anyway first. So. We've got metadata. Uh, they include data about the object bearing the inscription, such as how big it is, where it was found, what museum it is kept in. Uh, there are also physical data about the inscription, such as what size the inscribed area is, uh, what its characters look like. We've got some internal metadata about the inscription, such as what date it was uh, composed at, if it has a date, uh, or if it can be estimated. And in addition, we've also got bibliographic data, uh, where the inscription was first reported, uh, who has edited it, edited it and where it was published, uh, and major uh, articles and books discussing the inscription or its text or some kind of implication of it. Um, we're also working with images, although this has not been a high priority. We haven't been actively trying to amass high quality images, but I've been trying to at least keep track of the images I have worked with while re-editing texts, while re-editing the inscription texts. Uh, I had to look at facsimiles and photographs, and I've been trying to archive those. Uh, and in addition to these, uh, there are some, uh, to my mind, very easily uh, mm, conceivable, very easily realizable uh, additions that we can make to these. Uh, there have been some steps made toward adding translations, pre-published translations, but uh, new translations could just as easily be created if somebody is willing to do the work and retranslate the inscriptions. I do some of them myself, uh, and anybody is welcome to do others. Uh, commentaries can also be added uh, to the inscriptions. Uh, there's a lot of uh, gray data. There's a lot of uh, 
half-baked commentary that I've been writing as notes for myself while re-editing the inscriptions. They are not ready for the public, but they are preserved, and I'm hoping to be able to convert them to a sort of semi-readable, semi half, yeah, more than half-baked commentary uh, at a later time, or we could add geolocation information. Uh, so how do the metadata and the text fit together? Uh, first of all, uh, there is a way to include the metadata in the XML itself, uh, and perhaps that should be sufficient. Uh, uh, Epidoc has been designed with that in mind. Uh, a part of the file called the TEI header can include metadata, but uh, the main problem I see with that uh, is that it's not really object-oriented. It's very much text-oriented, uh, and in particular, uh, there are cases, not many admittedly, but there are, they're definitely there, where, for example, you've got an object which has several different inscriptions from different periods of history. Uh, or you might have an object that consists of multiple parts, either because it has been uh, fragmented, broken into several parts, uh, all or some of which are still extant, or because it was conceived as a composite object to begin with, for example, a set of copper plates. Uh, uh, copper plate land grants. And uh, to be able to represent these sort of complex relationships, several inscriptions on one object, one inscription on several objects, uh, it's probably easier, at least from our side of view, uh, to not just use Epidoc as the primary medium, but instead uh, to conceive of uh, our data in a way that there are several databases, basically an object database, uh, an inscription database, and a bibliographic database, or a bibliographic database table, uh, plus bits of edition, edition snippets, XML snippets that just contain the text edition, and the website, the SIDAM website, can work from a combination of these. When you visit SIDAM.UK, or when you visit SIDAM.UK a couple of weeks or months from now when it works better than it does right now, uh, <laughs> is it, uh, it's coming, I'm, I'm told. Um, so at that time, uh, what you see on the, uh, uh, in your browser uh, is what the website engine has put together from a bit of an XML plus the databases. And eventually, we hope it will also be able to export Epidoc so that the exported Epidoc contains all the metadata for that particular inscription, but that will be generated on the fly. I'll come back to that uh, in, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. Uh, so anyway, very quickly, uh, we might have an object database. So here is one inscribed object, the big pillar on the right, uh, and uh, there are metadata recorded for it. Uh, can you, you, you don't actually need to be able to read the small print, but uh, is it legible? Okay, I'm glad to hear. So that sort of data are recorded about an object. Similarly, uh, we have an inscription here. That's what's written on the pillar you've just seen. Uh, and we've got metadata recorded for it. Uh, so that's inscription metadata. Uh, and then we go on to the bi bibliography, which is, uh, meant to be recorded uh, as a database record, but in a way that is compliant with a structured TEI bibliography. So that, again, is something we don't have yet, uh, but what I hope we will be able to achieve uh, is that the website will be able to actually export uh, a full bibliography, perhaps even a partial bibliography, in TEI format. Uh, you know, TI bibliography uh, lets you use uh, analytic and monographic levels uh, with different uh, bits of information recorded for each. And so what we have right now uh, is we have references to the bibliography in various parts of the database. There is one, for example, to uh, what I classify as a book, although it's a, in a bit of a shady area. Uh, and there's a corresponding uh, entry in the bibliography table uh, at the monographic level. Uh, there's another bibliographic reference over here, uh, which is to a journal article. Uh, there's a bibliography table entry for that. Uh, and even within that bibliographic uh, entry, there's a reference to the journal, which will again be something on the monographic level uh, from a, a TEI bibliography uh, perspective, and there's a separate entry for that. Similarly, there are analytic entries for book chapters and monographic entries for books, which I'm not showing here. Uh, and of course, there are the images. Uh, 
which on the one hand need archiving and perhaps some uh, retouching uh, enhancement. And on the other hand, I need to record basic metadata about the images. So for example, for the pillar and inscription that you have seen, I've got a couple of images, basic metadata have been recorded for it, and we can, all, uh, we can show all of those images uh, on SIDM.UK. So, uh, yes, uh, basically to, to show you uh, in an image what I've uh, set so far, we've got an object database, we've got an inscription database, each uh, in, uh, involves, each, each incorporates metadata about the object side and the inscription side. Uh, the inscription database sort of draws in uh, the XML snippet, uh, which contains the addition, and potentially it could draw in also uh, a similar XML snippet with the translation and with the commentary. Uh, objects can consist of multiple parts, so there may be component objects, but there's always a sort of uh, hypothetical or virtual superordinate object, and it's only the superordinate object that is linked to an inscription. So if an object uh, consists of parts, then it's, uh, it's always the master object, the parent object, that is linked to an inscription. Uh, I don't want to go into any more detail than that, except to quickly mention that in this way, more complex relationships can also be represented in a fairly <coughs> simple way, which uh, does not, of course, map to all the intricacies of reality, but I believe this level of complexity <coughs> is uh, sort of a good midline for our purposes. Uh, so, to go back to uh, my previous outline of data management, uh, that was the simple view, and well, that is what actually happens. Uh, it's a bit tangled, uh, and I hope it can be simplified a little. Uh, but uh, let's uh, look at a few parts of this uh, diagram. So, first of all, uh, to, yeah, to zoom in on the sources, uh, I'll even try to magnify them, which I think I can do here. Yes, I can. Uh, that's, that's a simple bit. Uh, people have talked about uh, similar things before. Uh, basically, I've got the printed edition to start out with, uh, but to some extent, uh, the printed edition is supplemented by fieldwork research, which I might do or someone from, uh, from the project might do, or at a later time, someone from outside the project may do and contribute. Uh, Images and metadata are all sourced from the printed publications, but may also be supplemented uh, or augmented through fieldwork. And uh, both, uh, or all three of the images, the addition and the metadata, go their own separate ways. Uh, what ways are those? Uh, so to close in on the main thing we are doing, or I am doing, transformation and what we produce vis-a-vis uh, -vis digital data. Uh, yeah, okay, nice, almost nice, over here. Mm. Basically, uh, not much to do with images at this stage, a bit of post-processing and recording the image metadata, as I have shown before. Uh, for the addition, uh, that's quite a lot of work, but we don't need to go into the details. I need to add all the markup for the uh, Epidoc uh, XML. To produce this Epidoc edition snippet, which contains uh, just the, uh, what you call the edition division in the uh, Epidoc file, but not the TEI header. Uh, metadata need to be recorded in a structured way. We now have the table to do that, so uh, it's pretty straightforward uh, to record the metadata. Uh, now, uh, once we've got the snippet and we've got the structured metadata, uh, that's sort of fuel for the SIDDAM site to work with. Uh, but it's not really what we want to archive on Zenodo. When we're archiving things on Zenodo, we want to put up things that are more uh, compatible, more transparent, uh, and the best way to go about that is to produce those full Epidoc edition files that I mentioned at the beginning, which actually contain all the metadata for the inscription in the TEI header. This, of course, results in some level of redundancy. So if there's an, uh, there's an object, let's say the Junaga rock, uh, which has an inscription by Ashoka and another inscription by uh, a vassal or furatory of Skandagupta, uh, then the metadata for that rock will be included in the Epidoc editions for both of those inscriptions. Well, so far, since we're working on the Gupta period, we don't have the Ashoka inscription digitized, but we do have the Skandagupta inscription digitized. In future, Somebody will hopefully add the Ashoka inscription, 
and at that time uh, when somebody gets the epidoc files there will be two epidoc files containing data about the rock but I mean we'll have to live with that um, so anyway we need to incorporate those metadata in the XML file now at the moment uh, Gethin Rees does that uh, <laughs> sitting at the back here uh, he's uh, been kind enough to write a script uh, which uh, can extract the metadata from my tables and uh, put them into the XML files creating uh, the, uh, sort of merging them with the XML snippets um, yeah I think I think that about covers it uh, I haven't talked in detail about how we publish and archive the images and the bibliography because that's sort of still uh, in, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, still in the works basically. Uh, so how does this metadata integration thing work? Um, on the left hand side you can see the basic structure of an epidoc edition. <coughs> it has a TE on the header where I've written stuff goes here in green. <coughs> Uh, and then it uh, has a body part, and the body part contains different kinds of uh, divisions. Uh, and so the edition division can contain the pre-made XML snippet for the text edition. The translation division can very easily ingest a translation XML snippet if somebody creates one. We've got uh, a number of translations uh, tied up by subcontractors, but we are not yet in XML, but since we're not going to be adding a lot of markup to these, and the very basic markup like paragraph structure, uh, these can be created uh, in a matter of hours for all, all the translations we have, uh, once we have the, the means to incorporate that in the Epidoc edition. And similarly, we can do that for a commentary and for a property and a bibliographic uh, reference list to a master bibliography <coughs> file. Uh, so what I showed you before as Epidoc is actually the addition snippet. That goes in the addition division. And similarly, metadata from the table go in the Epidoc header. So for example, in the Epidoc header, there's a place for a title, and the title of an inscription from the metadata, uh, metadata table goes in there. Uh, or the Epidoc header has a place for an inscription identifier, an ID number, and our internal ID number goes in there. Uh, I should probably talk a little more about the ID numbers, which are sort of key to keeping track of all the work we do. Uh, but uh, the essence is that it's just, uh, just an arbitrary number. Uh, it could be any sort of number. We've uh, come up with uh, IN for inscription numbers and OB for object numbers and five digits in addition to that. Uh, and that's a stable identifier for all the inscriptions and all the objects in our database. And every file uh, that is in addition to the metadata tables, such as XML files with the inscription additions, and in future possibly XML files with translations or XML files with commentaries, will be identified using that number. Uh, that's, that's the essence. Uh, at the very beginning, I thought for some time, uh, just as Mark talked about his dilemma yesterday about how uh, to put the pew inscriptions in sequence, would there be any point in like, okay, let's start all the Gupta dynasty inscriptions by IN005. Uh, there isn't really a point. Uh, because on the one hand, uh, sometimes the qualifications are not quite clear. How do you know if an inscription is Gupta dynasty? Okay, let's suppose it's by a Gupta vassal, but maybe he was also a Bakataka vassal, or who knows? Or maybe you just don't know whose vassal he was. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, you can't account for new discoveries. So, uh, okay, you can always leave a number of empty slots, uh, but there's just no point. It's, it's, it's just a number. It doesn't need to be meaningful. The inscription identifying number doesn't need to tell you anything about the inscription, or the object number doesn't need to tell you anything about the object. Uh, the metadata do that, and the ID is just an ID. Um, okay, yeah, and an object title can also go in there, it doesn't matter. So, uh, how is the work shared? Uh, well, uh, most of it I do myself. As I mentioned, Gethin, thankfully, does the metadata integration. Uh, what complicates the picture a little bit uh, is that we now have subcontractors who take up some of the partial tasks, such as encoding published editions in XML, uh, recording metadata in our structured tables, or typing up translations. Uh, and we've also got some contributions from project members and in future, hopefully, from people outside who will either like post corrections to metadata 
or submit photographs or rubbings or whatever images uh, to us. Uh, all these data are mainly stored on Google Drive uh, and for all kinds of data there is one master version uh, for which only I have uh, edit privileges and everybody else can only view them and everyone else uh, has view access to the whole of the data set but basically when for example a subcontractor uh, uploads like uh, an XML they have transcribed or a metadata partial table that they have filled out then that comes up to the Google Drive, it uh, comes down to my computer and it's I who merge that new input while verifying it, uh, I merge it with the master set. So the master set uh, never gets uh, changed, never gets overruled, it's, it only gets gradually expanded, I mean never gets uh, changed or overruled by multiple people at the same time. Um, I think uh, this Google Drive thing uh, is, is good for our purposes at the moment. It's safe enough, uh, just in my own household, uh, it syncs daily to the three separate hard drives, uh, plus the copy in the cloud, and I do hope, though I'm not certain, that some of the other project members, including some of the PIs, actually sync it down to their own local hard drives sometimes and don't just keep it in the cloud. But even if it's just in the cloud, plus on my hard drives, that's probably safe enough. Uh, and every now and then, uh, the unfinished or work in progress files are also archived on Zenodo. Uh, now, a little more uh, about uh, what I hope will simplify this workflow uh, in uh, the not so distant future. Uh, work is going on on this. Uh, as I said, the SIDM.UK website is a bit uh, rudimentary at the moment, and there are bits of it that are broken, uh, but it's being... being uh, improved and uh, one of the main things we're hoping to have in the near future uh, is a working CMS, a content management system uh, and the content management system will basically simplify our workflow in two ways. One of those ways will be, uh, thank you, one of those ways will be that we can get rid of the Excel file and the Word doc and whatever that I have on my Google Drive and the master version will be simply the version that is on SIDHUM.UK. Uh, either I or a subcontractor, anyone who wants to add something or correct something, can directly correct metadata or inscription, uh, inscription bits into the SIDHUM site through the web, uh, website interface. And the same content management system will, I hope, take care of what Gethin manually or semi-automatically does now uh, and create those exportable full epidoc files that contain metadata in the headers which can then be either downloaded by end users or can be uh, at regular intervals archived into Zenodo. That's all I was going to speak about. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Please. I have a question. Maybe I missed this, but um, you mentioned Junar. So, for yeah. example, for Junar, we have Harry Falk's book, yeah. which contains a great deal of detail about the physical site, mm -hmm. contains GPS coordinates, mm -hmm. and um, uh, not an not a, uh, edition of the inscription, but a lot of material about the surface and so yeah. forth. It seems like when you have that kind of information, it would be... What I heard you say is, we could maybe in the future, whatever, but <laughs> that information is already available and known to be reliable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, for most inscriptions and most objects, there's a lot of known and reliable information out there. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two things we can do. Uh, one is to uh, duplicate at least part of that inscription uh, in the website, I don't know, inscription, part of that information uh, on the website. And the other is, of course, to just include a bibli uh, bibliographic reference. Uh, so, obviously, uh, I mean, there are entire books dedicated to some of the objects or some of the sites, and we're not going to transcribe all the texts of those books. I mean, even if there were no copyright restrictions on that, uh, the manpower restrictions would prevent us from doing that. Yeah. So what we want to do is basically to become, on the one hand, an index uh, with a bibliography. Yeah, that's where you go for more information. 
Uh, and on the other hand, uh, the website is, uh, is also a tool for working with the inscription. You can, uh, you can click and display the inscription as a diplomatic edition. You can click and display it uh, as uh, an amended uh, editorial version. Uh, and hopefully, you will be able to search in the inscription text or across multiple inscription texts with various uh, restriction criteria. So that's, that's what we want to do. Obviously, we're not going to be able to like, uh, ingest every single bit of information and, and put it out there on the web. That, does that answer your question? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a kind of question where there is an answer to it. It's <laughs> um, I mean, it's really an ongoing question how much, in any kind of project, mm. I guess, mm. how much you want to send your users to something else mm. for everything, mm. right? And how much you want to, as you said, ingest, mm. sort of. Um, and I wonder, I mean, obviously, ideally, all the inscriptions get re-edited, obviously. But there's a mm. lot of material, for example, for the older publications, which is basically in public domain, which could be actually, you could actually upload the publications into the system itself. Uh, you could. Indian uh, Antiquary, for example, I believe. You, 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 you could upload the publication company. itself, uh, but... Uh, I'm not sure it's worth the while. I mean, what we're trying to create here is something that's machine readable. Uh, yeah. Now, okay, somebody has scanned Indian Antiquary. It's out there on DLI, or the well, DLI is no longer uh, extant, but it's there on archive.org, most of it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, people can hopefully find it for themselves. Uh, but uh, let's say uh, uh, a portal outside SIDAM will not be able to read uh, the scanned Indian Antiquary that I right. upload to SIDAM. Uh, so yes, it, it, it would be nice, it would simplify uh, some other people's work a little uh, if we at least, for example, linked to Indian Antiquary on archive.org, but that's not the main thing we're interested right. in. It's something that, I mean, if, if this whole thing takes off uh, and it becomes uh, really uh, a sort of crowdsourceable venture, like the Chinese text, for example, then uh, I hope uh, that users and outside contributors in future will add links of that sort. Okay, this Indian antiquary is actually, that's the archive.org link where you can download yeah. it from. Right. It's not Thank a priority you. right now. Yeah, yeah Daud? Yeah, um, are there any aspects of this design, this, uh, this uh, what, what you're doing here, which would um, make this more uh, small yeah. compared to later periods and other regions in India. And there you're faced with other issues with, for example, where large numbers of inscriptions are unpublished or um, only available in establishments at the ASI and things like yeah. that. Yeah. And so uh, do you think this would be expandable into those, in, into those kind of I, I certainly hope so. Uh, I, can't, I can't really predict the future. Uh, the way I feel about this is uh, we're at the start of something really big. It's like, you know, the, uh, the little rocks that begin to slide from mountain top to become an avalanche. Uh, and some of those little rocks will not be part of the avalanche. And some of those little rocks will just stop on the way down. Uh, but I'm hoping to be one of those bigger rocks that will actually generate the avalanche. I mean, all of this kind of work will be a lot easier 10 years from now. Several times now in, in, in these, uh, during this conference, I've been reminded of uh, Douglas Adams, uh, who's... Uh, uh, I, I forget the name of, uh, name of that hero, but he, uh, in his youth, he spent, I don't know, three days trying to make the computer play three blind mice. Uh, and uh, when asked, was that, wasn't that very futile? He said, well, uh, no, because uh, it taught me a lot about working with computers. Uh, so, I mean, right now what we're trying to do is pave the way to make this kind of work simpler. And as it gathers momentum, uh, I think uh, maybe five years from now, either for me or for someone else, uh, adding 10 inscriptions, for example, to a similar database will take as much time as it takes for me now to add one inscription. And in 10 years' time, maybe somebody will be able to add 10,000 inscriptions in as much time as it takes for me to add one now. But first, we have to do the groundwork, and that's what we're doing now. So I'm afraid we have to end the discussion.